<laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute for this very special occasion. Uh, I'm Christy Carpenter. If, I ha if there's anybody in this room I haven't yet met, I hope to meet you. I'm the CEO here at the Institute. Uh, we are especially appreciative uh, to have so many members of the Rockefeller family with us. It means so much to have them uh, join us for this, for this wonderful celebration. And we're pleased to have so many outstanding Arkansans uh, in this room. I mean, virtually, I mean, everybody who's here is an outstanding Arkansan, but I'm going to mention just a few. Uh, the president of the University of Arkansas System, Don Bobbitt, and his wife, Susan, along with some of the Institute's board, including our vice chair, Barry McCune, Dean Deborah Baldwin, Mary Story, Archie Schaefer, and Arkansas's own Lisanne Rockefeller. We're also delighted that several of the trustees of the Winthrop Rockefeller Charitable Trust that make this institute possible are here. Marion Burton, Bruce Bartley, and Wilson Jones. And we also have the leadership of several other Winthrop Rockefeller organizations that you will be hearing from uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, we think there's something special in the air up on Petty Jean Mountain. I want you to know the weather is always like this in the summer in Arkansas. <laughs> For those of you that are out of town. Just <laughs> anyway, but we think there's something very special uh, up here uh, at, in this environment and that it's conducive to fresh thinking and the free exchange of ideas. And it's our great pleasure to share with you today what, we, what really promises to be a fascinating program. Our goal is to send you off tomorrow stimulated, enriched, and inspired. We're going to start out right now with just a short film uh, to introduce you to a man. Uh, many of you knew him, at least some of you knew him, uh, but he's the man whose memory we celebrate today. <laughs> As a member of one of the most influential and wealthy families in America, it would have been easy for Winthrop Rockefeller to simply let life come to him. But he was a different breed, a nonconformist, some might even say a rebel, his own man, born with an independent spirit. Rockefeller spent half his life searching for something, something within himself, something outside of his family's expectations. He withdrew from his studies at Yale and went on to work as a roughneck in the Texas oil fields. Rockefeller then enlisted in the Army and served in World War II, where he received the Bronze Star, was wounded, and earned the Purple Heart. During his time in the military, he became friends with an Arkansan named Frank Newell. After returning from the war, Rockefeller married Barbara Bobo Sears, and they had a son his only child, Winthrop Paul. In the summer of 1953, Frank Newell invited Rockefeller to Arkansas for a reprieve from the hustle and bustle of New York City. It was precisely what he'd been searching for his whole life. Rockefeller and his eagerly adopted state of Arkansas would never be the same. When he moved to Arkansas, Winthrop Rockefeller built a new life for himself and his family atop Petty Jean Mountain. Demonstrating a purpose and vision for his own life that had not been seen before, Rockefeller immediately developed a premier working cattle ranch he called Winrock Farms. He hosted thousands of visitors from across the nation to his innovative farm. This site served as a model for progress and an inspiration for change in Arkansas. Though not politically ambitious, Winthrop Rockefeller was determined to do anything he could to enact positive change in Arkansas. Appointed chairman of the Arkansas Industrial Development Commission, largely due to his famous last name, Rockefeller nonetheless immersed himself in his responsibilities. Under his guidance, 
90,000 new jobs were created in Arkansas. Ultimately, Rockefeller realized that his efforts would have to include political and election reform in order to facilitate the changes he knew were necessary for Arkansas to truly free itself from the shackles of the past. Rockefeller threw his trademark cowboy hat into the political ring and, along with it, his single-minded focus and determination to reform what he saw as a backward and corrupt political system based on patronage and cronyism. His election in 1966 made him the 37th governor of Arkansas and the state's first Republican governor since Reconstruction. Rockefeller's lifelong commitment to civil rights was also evident. As governor, he named William Sonny Walker to a cabinet-level position, the first Arkansas governor to appoint a black cabinet member. Rockefeller was also the only Southern governor to hold a public memorial service after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Winthrop Rockefeller's governorship was a watershed moment for the state and paved the way for future progressive candidates to hold the office. Upon leaving office, Governor Rockefeller said he wanted historians to think of him as more than a political phenomenon. He wanted to be remembered, in his words, as a catalyst who hopefully served to excite in the hearts and minds of our people a desire to shape our own destiny. He did so by creating business, artistic, and educational opportunities for his fellow Arkansans. Rockefeller was a pioneer of philanthropy in Arkansas. In a letter to his son, he wrote of his family, while we lived comfortably with that which we inherited and earned, we had the responsibility to see that these resources were also used wisely in the service to our fellow man. Rockefeller's philanthropic efforts focused on strengthening America's place in the world and building Arkansas. Winthrop Rockefeller cared deeply for the people of Arkansas but he also recognized the global relevance of the problems and opportunities he found in the state. Let's see if we can get, get the lights on again. <laughs> By the way, you're sitting here in, uh, in what used to be many years ago. This is the show barn, and it used to be where Governor Rockefeller showed his prize, uh, his prize cattle. And uh, when you go out, if you look very high, you'll see a large, the large head of Rocky, who was the first Santa Gertrudis bull that, uh, that uh, Winthrop Rockefeller purchased and uh, brought from the, here from the King Ranch. Uh, and while you're here, please visit our gallery. I'll just mention, if you want to learn more about Winthrop Rockefeller, we have a, a wonderful exhibit, uh, permanent exhibit there, and it's just behind the reception desk when you come in. Uh, the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute is one of three organizations that carry forth Governor Rockefeller's uh, vision and values. The Institute is the newest. Uh, we were established just seven years ago by the Winthrop Rockefeller Charitable Trust in conjunction with the University of Arkansas system. We're all about bringing together great minds for the betterment of humanity. You heard just a few minutes ago, uh, Winthrop Rockefeller was a, was a convener. Um, he also was a catalyst, and, and we're following along in that tradition. He believed that, quote, every citizen has the duty to be informed, to be thoughtfully concerned, and to participate in the search for solutions, unquote. And you'll see that quotation painted in the ante room when you, when you uh, exit uh, this space uh, later on. But it's that belief that guides everything we do here at the Institute. In this centennial year, we've sharpened the vision for our work and are focusing on convening leading thinkers, innovators, and practitioners to develop solutions to some of today's most vexing problems, not just in Arkansas, but problems that extend on the national level and the international level as well. And we're working on engaging, energizing, and inspiring people of all ages to get involved and put those solutions to practice. Ultimately, our forums are designed to reach beyond this mountain and to impact people's lives in a very positive way. 
Three thematic areas reflective of Governor Rockefeller are of special interest to us. Food security and sustainable agriculture, civic engagement, and philanthropy. And in the area of philanthropy, we're focusing on the increasingly critical role of philanthropy in the 21st century. Uh, we'll also be, uh, do so, we'll do so primarily, I guess I should say, by promoting innovative approaches such as social entrepreneurship and impact investing. And what more appropriate occasion to launch our work in the area of philanthropy than this centennial celebration. Now the word philanthropy is derived from two uh, Greek words which together mean the love of mankind. Today most people associate that word when they hear it with writing checks or dropping cash in a donation plate. But truly the word encompasses far, far more. Any gift of self is a form of philanthropy and rich, poor, or in between, we each have the opportunity to be philanthropists every day, even through simple acts of kindness, which are the most fundamental form of giving. Winthrop Rockefeller was many things, a maverick, a visionary, a political leader, and a reformer, a family man. But whatever the role he played, whatever he did was ultimately driven by a love of mankind. His philanthropy came from the heart. Through his parents, his grandparents, and his faith, he fully absorbed the notion that with great wealth comes great obligation and great opportunity to do good for one's fellow man. He acted on these lessons throughout his life. As his son Winthrop Paul once said about his father, quote, to him philanthropy was not simply about writing a check. It was real and tangible sort of activity in which, it, in which one engaged on a momentary, hourly, and daily basis, something that was visceral more than just cerebral, unquote. Rockefeller thought about the big and tough questions, particularly as they pertained to Arkansas, he asked how he could help resolve things. His desire to help was totally instinctive. He was ever ready to roll up his sleeves, bring together experts right here on this mountain, and energize others to join him in making Arkansas a more prosperous, equitable, and vibrant state. We'll learn more today about the roots of his philanthropy. We'll also learn about the ongoing engagement of the entire Rockefeller family. I believe it's 260 strong. Am I right, Peter? Yes, 260 people. And just how they go about today manifesting a love of mankind in just about every field of human endeavor in many parts of the globe. For more than 150 years, this remarkable and uniquely American story of Rockefeller philanthropy has been unfolding. Amazingly, this story started with one boy, one very brilliant, industrious, and religious boy, born in humble surroundings in upstate New York in 1839. So let's start there at the very beginning with two scholars who know more about the Rockefeller family and its extraordinary legacy of giving than just about anyone. First, I'd like to introduce Jim Allen Smith, a historian of philanthropy and the vice president of research and education at the Rockefeller Archive Center in Sleepy Hollow, New York. As you'll see from his bio in the program, Jim has spent a good part of his career in foundation work and also has written extensively about the arts, cultural policy, and philanthropy. I met Jim last summer when I visited the archive uh, and spent a fascinating afternoon there talking with him. And he led me through how John D. Sr. and his son moved traditional charity to modern to create, really, what is modern philanthropy. When Jim said to me, well, you know, much of it was based on germ theory, G-E-R-M theory, that is, I knew then and there I was in for an enthralling afternoon. Please join uh, me in welcoming Jim, uh, Jim Allen Smith to the stage. <laughs> Peter Johnson has been deeply engaged with the Rockefeller family for 36 years as a historian, a writer, and advisor. He's worked closely with three of Winthrop Rockefeller's brothers, John D. III, Lawrence, and David. He also co-authored two volumes on the family, the Rockefeller Century and the Rockefeller Conscience. 
As you can see in his bio, Peter serves on several very significant boards and is currently developing a comprehensive database on Rockefeller family investments in the late 19th century to the present. Please join me in welcoming Peter Johnson. Well, I tell you, we could not have a more knowledgeable pair to give us an overview of modern philanthropy. So, uh, and it's going to be a challenge to pack it into the time frame, but we're going to we're going to get started here. Uh, let me throw out the first uh, question and uh, to the two of you: How early does John D. Rockefeller's charity emerge? When when do we first begin to see it? Well, <laughs> we begin to see it um, in one of the favorite documents that we have uh, at the Rockefeller Archive Center in, we will call him Senior today, um, as our convention, um, when Senior, who was then only 15, was a young bookkeeper in Cleveland. And in his Ledger A, uh, a meticulously kept um, entry of every expenditure, uh, every bit of income, we see this young boy with his bookkeeper's salary of about $500 a year giving to Baptist causes, uh, international Baptist causes. In fact, some of the entries are for Baptist mission societies. But I think the tradition begins even earlier than that from uh, his mother and uh, a family tradition uh, in a part of the country that Peter and I both love, the so-called burnt over district of upstate New York. Uh, fire and brimstone burnt it over. It wasn't forest fires. Uh, it was ardent Baptists and uh, a tradition that, uh, that uh, I think sustained uh, the early philanthropy. Do you want to say more, Peter? Well, I, I think it's very important at, at, the, at the outset to remind people or inform them for the first time that uh, we tend to associate Rockefeller philanthropy with males. But women were as deeply engaged and maybe as, I think, equally important in the definition of philanthropy and in the passing on of those particular values. In this case, Eliza Davison Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller's mother, was the one who instilled the sort of values of charity, of tithing, of becoming concerned about your fellow man and woman. Uh, and it is from her really that the, 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 Rockefeller, uh, the Rockefeller philanthropic tradition begins. And this, as Jim correctly points out, is based upon uh, the, uh, the, the sort of the fervor, the passion, the deep religiosity of the American Protestant tradition where tithing was a, a requirement. It wasn't an option. You can see here the, the very <laughs> modest beginnings uh, in uh, the family home uh, in Richford, New York. Uh, another, uh, as they moved about to Moravia, uh, New York, uh, we, we wanted to underscore that it all began very modestly. Yeah, and what were his earliest charitable interests, John D. Sr.? <laughs> Jim and I are gonna just do a ping pong here uh, to, yeah. to get through, but I, uh, his earliest charitable gifts were almost exclusively to Baptist organizations. This was not, nothing particularly unusual at that time in mid-19th century America. You tended to give to organizations within your own religious denomination. Uh, so support of his church was very important. Uh, Jim Morty mentioned that there were pan-Baptist organizations that existed. The American Foreign, the uh, Baptist Foreign Mission Society, the Baptist Home Mission Society, and the American uh, Bible Society. And this is where a lot of his money, not just when he was young, but for a significant portion of his adult years, actually went. These were the existing institutions to deal with social problems. And this is where John D. Rockefeller con contributed the uh, majority of his funds fairly early in his life. Yeah. And so how did, um, I mean, he really was the embodiment of the American, of, well, of the Protestant work ethic in a lot of ways, uh, it seems. Um, what, can you talk a little bit about how those religious beliefs, uh, you know, blended in with his, also with his, uh, his business aptitudes and his, uh, you know, his 
ability to be successful as a moneymaker. I, I think the most important aspect of that Protestant tradition is the notion of stewardship, that what you earn uh, is, in many respects, God-given. Uh, and on a number of occasions, senior would actually say, God gave me my money. And in giving that money, it came with an obligation to give it back. Uh, we have a couple of quotes up here. I actually wanted to, to point out, uh, again, the bookkeeper and giving to his church. We have these wonderful charity index cards in, uh, in the archives. And you can see uh, the young boy here giving to, uh, to his church. And every entry is itemized. Uh, you can see another card uh, as the wealth grows, the giving, the earnings lead him to move from the 6%, I think, that we count in his early giving uh, to full tithing and, and then indeed to even more. But stewardship is the most important concept, I think, that comes out of the Protestant tradition. Yeah. Uh, and there were other uh, pioneers, aside from John D. Rockefeller Sr., in, uh, in the early days of, of this movement from traditional charity to philanthropy. Andrew Carnegie was one. Did they, did they um, know each other or did they talk about um, about what they were doing in their, in, as they approached that <clears throat> I'm not sure if they ever actually met each other, though they mm -hmm. didn't live very far away from each other in New York. It would be very possible. Carnegie was, in many ways, very different. He liked to drink scotch and so on, so it wasn't that they, uh, they hung out together. Uh, but I, I do recall that one year they gave each other a uh, Christmas present, and Andrew Carnegie, knowing that John D. Rockefeller was a teetotaler, sent him a bottle of scotch for Christmas. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, John D. Rockefeller, knowing of Andrew Carnegie's well-known Scottish frugality, sent him a box of, of uh, paper collars for Christmas. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, Carnegie was the, the, the first sort of powerful modern expression of modern philanthropy wrote an article in the, uh, the North American Review in 1889 in which he challenged the newly wealthy in the United States to become engaged in the, uh, the, the solution of social problems. And he said something that was uh, personally very uh, uh, determinative for him. He said, the man who dies, dies wealthy dies ashamed, or dies shamed. Disgraced. Oh, disgraced, disgraced. It's been a long time since I read the article. Uh, the, the, uh, it, it's very important because what he was saying, and, and Carnegie was very, very, uh, it was n notably an agnostic. So he was saying, we don't have a religious obligation. We have sort of a moral obligation and a human obligation to help other people. Uh, that had a profound effect on John D. Rockefeller, who was already giving a lot, but it was almost as if he said, maybe I need to shift the direction in which my philanthropy is moving. Uh, we, we, we can't say, yes, this is a cause and effect, but it's shortly after the, uh, the famous Carnegie uh, article that Senior begins to give in a very different way than he'd given prior to 1890. Senior did compliment him on that article. There, there are some exchanges. Yeah. One of my favorite, though, they, they didn't share a taste for scotch, but they were both golfers. You would expect that of the Scott um, Carnegie. <laughs> and um, we have a little handwritten note uh, in the archives where uh, Carnegie says, my wife and I were motoring in the neighborhood and we thought we would stop in to see you, but recall that it was the Sabbath. Um, and they didn't, um, in fact, uh, stop. But in the popular imagination, they were competitive in their philanthropy. And we do have cartoons showing the two of them together uh, dropping off bags of money uh, to do different things. <laughs> and and th there was a, a kind of national fascination with uh, the philanthropic competition between the two great uh, magnates. Yeah, would well, you talk to us a little bit about the, this transition from, uh, from traditional charity uh, to modern philanthropy and the role that germ theory uh, played in all of that, Jim? Um, 
th this recalls our, our early conversation. Um, I think it's important to recall that the charitable tradition through many, many centuries uh, has been one of helping individuals, of alleviating individual distress, of giving alms to the poor beggar in the street. What we see, this is true of both Carnegie and Rockefeller and some of the other very wealthy people of the late 19th, early 20th century, is the invention of modern, organized philanthropy. Why would it happen in this period? First, the scale of these fortunes uh, was enormous. Fortunes had not been seen on this scale before. Secondly, we see people moving from giving to their local community, to a narrow set of institutions that might be their own uh, uh, sectarian commitments, to national and even international causes. In doing this, they had to invent a different set of, of institutions, and they had to think differently about philanthropy. They were no longer focusing explicitly on the individual in need, but they were looking to the social roots of disease. They were looking to broader causes. And I think it's fair to say um, that that generation was affected hugely by some of the scientific and medical advances of the 19th century. And when uh, Koch and Pasteur and others began talking about germs as the causes of diseases, single causes that could be eradicated, people looked to, um, to the uses of philanthropy in more scientific ways. If we can understand the cause of something, if we can eradicate the cause of that problem, then we can use philanthropy as a mechanism to solve things. And uh, this notion of scientific philanthropy began to replace the older notions of religious charity for individuals. Right, and in their approach um, to, to trying to eradicate these problems, they used, they used some uh, scientific methodologies, but they, they brought in experts, didn't they? Yeah. And, I mean, you want to talk uh, some about the General <coughs> Education Board and some of the other, the hookworm uh, project and uh, other sure. elements? Of the, uh, I, I think there, let me just emphasize first yeah. the word that, uh, that Jim has used, which is organized. These are two men that built some of the most powerful industries that the world has ever seen, steel and petroleum. That just didn't happen uh, <clears throat> without them giving it enormous thought. So both Carnegie and Rockefeller were convinced that in order to deal with social problems, you needed a mechanism, you needed an organization that was capable of dealing with the problem over long periods of time and in a very effective manner. Uh, that, so that becomes a new characteristic. It's not to say that there weren't charities that were well organized and bureaucratic and so on, but this was a much more dynamic conception of how to deal with problems. It also, or maybe the first time in history, a, uh, a belief that somehow you could eliminate the causes of human misery, that they were just not something you had, had to suffer through and give money to help those that were afflicted by them. There was a deep belief that we could eliminate disease. It's one we still have. A deep belief that you could eliminate ignorance, a belief we still have. Remember, the, the, I remember uh, being on a panel with Ron Chernow a number of years ago. You know, the, the average life expectancy of a human being in the 1890s was about 45 to 47 years. Cities in the world did not grow through natural increase in population. They only grew from in-migration. Tons, thousands of people died. It was, for the most part, you had no idea how many people were dying every year. This was pretty dramatic stuff. Uh, so here you have some people who say, maybe we can affect these things that have been in, in existence since time began and they actually went about trying to accomplish that. It's a really kind of a remarkable thing when you think about it. It's, it's both kind of a, a belief in human perfectibility and a belief in the, uh, the capacity of human beings to understand 
these forces and to try and do something about them. And what this meant was building new institutions. And I think if we were to point to the two early, earliest and greatest accomplishments of Rockefeller philanthropy, we would have to point first to the University of Chicago and to the work that Senior undertook with a Baptist minister, another upstate New York, burnt over Baptist, Frederick T. Gates, um, who had been at the University of Rochester, um, who met him when the Baptists were saying, our denomination really doesn't have a great university yet, despite our alma mater, Brown, which was Baptist, um, <laughs> and the University of Rochester, which is uh, not terrible either. Um, but they wanted a Baptist institution in the growing part of the country, in Chicago. And Gates, who had been working with the American Baptist Education Society and Rockefeller, began to talk about how to build a great university and to build it quickly. And beginning in 1889, they devoted their energies to building that university. And here you see the first major donation, the $600,000 gift, to be matched <coughs> by people in Chicago with $400,000. And it was with that in one of the most remarkably quick institution building uh, endeavors of, of uh, the late 19th century, the University of Chicago took shape. And it took shape, um, I, this underscores the message of the letter, uh, it had to be a matching gift. And uh, there you see the other individual who made uh, the university uh, what it was. It was William Rainey Harper working with Senior uh, on the left. Do you want to say more about Chicago? Well, <clears throat> we were one of our colleagues here, and probably maybe more than, uh, than that, Jack Myers, whom you'll hear from tomorrow, is a graduate PhD from the University of Chicago. Uh, the fact that the University of Chicago became a world-class institution on the same level with Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Oxford, and Cambridge within a decade is an example of how <laughs> uh, it, it, applying funds in the right way can achieve miraculous ends. Uh, when the, uh, the intention of John D. Rockefeller to uh, donate this, these funds was announced to the, uh, the, the delegates attending the American Baptist Education Society annual meeting in Boston at the Tremont uh, the, uh, uh, just spontaneously, the, uh, the delegates all broke into the hymn, Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, now despite what John D. Rockefeller wrote in that letter, and he meant it, uh, William Rainey Harper was one of the greatest educational entrepreneurs in the history of the world. And uh, John D. Rockefeller was not easy to get money out of. He was very, very cautious and careful and you know, wanted to know a lot about the organization. It would appear that William Rainey Harper could come to New York and wheedle any amount of money he wanted out of John D. Rockefeller <laughs> to the point that in the early part of the 20th century, uh, everybody became very worried about this, that uh, Harper was going to get the entire Rockefeller fortune if they weren't careful. And uh, they may have come up with the $400,000 of matching funds, but they didn't come up with much more than that. So uh, and in fact, I think it was at this, uh, this graduation yeah. ceremony, commencement, which may explain why Harper looks a little um, uh, distraught. Uh, he announced, I'm giving you one further gift of $10 million, and then you don't get any more. <laughs> so, and this taught the Rockefellers a very important lesson, which will carry on through uh, other conversations today, that if something is worth doing, it's worth a lot of people doing, and you should get as many people involved in that activity as you possibly can. And the Rockefellers have, have stuck with that pretty, pretty carefully for the last 111 years. But so, we should say that the, the giving to the university uh, through that early period was $35 million. 
in which in today's dollars it would be <coughs> probably. We'll multiply it by yeah. 20 or 25. Yeah, right. Right. Now, a, a, a lot of their early interests, uh, of his early interests in philanthropy, were focused on public health and medicine. Can you tell us some of, something about that? <clears throat> the, uh, why concentrate on those two, uh, two areas? A lot of it was devoted exclusively to public health and, and education. Those seem to be the, uh, to, to use a, uh, a term that I don't use in normal conversation, the best vectors to approach, uh, uh, to, to really secure f uh, reform, change in American society. Uh, quite obviously, because of germ theory, all of a sudden people realized that it wasn't because somebody had cast a spell on you or you had breathed uh, malarial air in a swamp that you were getting sick. It was from, uh, uh, from germs. So creating public health systems would go a very, very long way, introducing very, very basic kinds of things like wash your hands and so on and so forth. I, I can remember my, my grandmother uh, did her nurses training in New York in about 1912, just as all of this was beginning. And if she told me once a day, uh, she told me a hundred times a day to wash my hands. And that was actually public health. Uh, educational curriculum in, in schools stress those kinds of things. Uh, creating a more educated citizenry, creating a public health system were methods by which reform could be achieved and progress. I think it's also important to say um, that the reform of medical education, the beginnings of scientific medicine, owe of everything, I would say, to the second great institutional uh, accomplishment of uh, seniors philanthropy. And that was the creation of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, modeled on two European uh, research institutions. But if you're going to understand the root causes, you've got to have a scientific framework for doing medical research. You've got to have better medical education and in the previous slide, I showed you Gates with Simon Flexner, uh, the first president of, of, um, of what is now the university. Um, this institution, started in 1901, uh, has been a continuing generation after generation commitment of, of this family. And um, 24 Nobel laureates to date have done their work at the Rockefeller University. Um, I also like to point out with this wonderful photograph, we have, by the way, 900,000 photographs at the Rockefeller <laughs> Archive Center. Uh, I, I've chosen fewer than half. Um, <laughs> so this will end at some point. But um, it's important uh, to see uh, the university as it exists uh, in, in the background, um, but also the war demonstration hospital. Um, the hospital very early on, uh, again, uh, only uh, 13 or 14 years old at this point, uh, began to do work during World War I. And uh, a very important and I think decisive moment in Rockefeller philanthropy came with World War I. Do you want to no. say more about that era? <coughs> or no? Let's, we'll, we'll move to the GEB okay. and then come back. Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, we should talk about it because there was a, a lot of the early philanthropic work that uh, Senior engaged in uh, was directed at the South. Um, so, Peter, can you tell us more about that? <coughs> the, after the Civil War, of course, the South had been devastated by uh, uh, Union armies. Uh, just the, the, the whole process of, uh, of war had uh, created quite a crisis. Uh, northern philanthropists and others moved in. They were not just scalawags and so on who uh, you know, tried to uh, steal as much money as they could, but a lot of very well-intentioned and committed people who came south and, and worked on various kinds of things. Uh, that persisted for a very, very long time. This, the south took a very long time to recover from the ravages of war. Uh, the General Education Board, and, and also from the persistence of the racial divide in the South. Uh, blacks in the American South were the, the most uh, 
uh, the poorest, the most poorly educated, uh, had the worst health of any group of Americans, with the possible exception of, of Native Americans during this time. Uh, an effort to sort of generally upgrade the, uh, the, uh, the condition in the South began in the 1890s, actually much earlier with George Foster. 1867, George, George Foster Peabody began to work on this. Uh, but in the la latter part of the 19th century, a renewed effort to improve uh, uh, the health and general condition in the South began. And John D. Rockefeller Jr. was part of that effort, even though his father was the one who put up the money. This led to the creation of the, of the General Education Board, which initially was interested only in creating a public school system in the American South. In 1900, only one state in the American South had a compulsory education law, and that was Kentucky. No other southern state required public education in any way. So the initial effort was actually to convince southern governments, southern legislatures, to enact laws enabling a public school system to be created. I, uh there, there's so many important things to say about the General Education Board. Um, the, the most interesting to me... Which was, a, let's just make it clear, this was uh, something that they created. This, this was one of these yes. new institutions. It is interesting the Rockefeller name is not on it because they hoped that others would be encouraged to join them in the cause of improving Southern education. But it was... As I recall, $129 million uh, in 1902-1903, or through that decade, not all in one chunk. And the aim was to improve education regardless of race, color, creed. And just so far-seeing and, in some respects, so smart. Where do you have the points of intervention? when there is no public education system, when you don't have teachers who can teach in elementary or secondary schools, uh, when you don't have a tax base to support uh, a public education system, the first point of intervention, they felt, we have to build high schools. Because if you can get someone through high school, you've not only got the potential for someone who can go back and teach in a one-room school, teaching basic literacy and arithmetic, you've also got the potential for people to go to college and to move on to higher education. But without a tax base, what do you do? You've got to improve the agricultural economy. We have an image here of one of the schools uh, that they built. Uh, again, we have marvelous photographs before and after pictures. 1,600 high schools were built or improved. We have uh, this, this is here simply because it's such a lovely photo. Two uh, young children being uh, taken to school in their buggy. But this is the real point of intervention. Agricultural agents supported with GEB money were helping to improve agricultural productivity uh, in, in the first decades of, of the 20th century. And they did such creative things. They, they realized that to change traditional agricultural habits, they should get to the children. And so they set up corn clubs. Uh, they would encourage people to give a half an acre to one of the young boys in the family. They would teach them about hydrology. Uh, they would teach them about weeding. They would teach them about spacing the seeds. And the children, and, and this Frank Brockman, famous in his day, no doubt, um, <laughs> was able to produce 160 bushels of corn. On average, and the GEB kept meticulous data, um, the children would have three and four times the yield of their parents. They also worked with girls, realizing that if they could learn how to can and preserve uh, fruits and vegetables, they wouldn't have to go to the general store during the winter. Diet would be better uh, through the winter. They could improve the domestic economy. And uh, we see here um, 
uh, the work of one of the canning clubs, and they were taught to do canning to FDA standards, uh, which uh, was fascinating. Uh, so the General Education Board, and, and here you can see, I think, the celebration uh, in one community in North Carolina, the first high school graduating class. Uh, now, were African Americans particularly the beneficiaries of, of these new schools? No. I, I, I think it's important to say mm -hmm. um, that um, the GEB understood, as most Northern philanthropists did, if you worked only with the African American population, you were going to alienate the white population. Uh, more resources went to white schools than to black schools. It was a tough political decision that you simply could not alienate the white community. And um, yeah. that was the reality. And there, another element of the interest in the South and uh, what related to hookworm. You want to just yep. quickly tell us about, uh, about <coughs> this is We're both wearing yeah. shoes, you'll yeah. notice. Yeah. Yeah. This um, is part of this kind of multi-pronged offensive that eventually uh, emerged uh, to, to, to deal with the problem of, of moderniz modernization in the South. Uh, I think both Jim and I would like to say that, that uh, the people at the General Education Board and John D. Rockefeller Jr. and other Northern philanthropists had thought all of this through and that it was only over time that they uh, unrolled all of these things. One thing led to another. Uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. actually wanted to focus on improving black education exclusively and was advised that if you do that, it will be defeated. Uh, they'll, they'll, you'll create jealousy and a feeling of, uh, uh, of rancor among the, the broader white population. That's when they decided to, to do the, uh, the both black and white. But they realized that in order to create a public school system, you needed to do all of these other things. So it became uh, kind of a, a community-wide effort, uh, in a way, uh, in order to accomplish this. A couple of, uh, at least one other point is very important to make here. The intention was not to keep the General Education Board going for the rest of time to provide the money and the staff and the educational resources. What was really intended was to start this, but then to convince governments that this was part of their responsibility. And they were wonderful uh, educators of that generation of Southern politicians and Southern leaders that this is the way into the future for your citizens, for your people is to begin to do all of these things that are not being done. And good philanthropy attempts to do that. It attempts to alert the rest of society to the existence of problems and get society to take responsibility for the changes. And here with the General Education Board, you see one of the most powerful examples of that happening. 1900, there are no public schools in the American South, or very few. By 1910, 1920, there are not only public school systems in the American South, there are now departments of education in southern states and a tax system designed to produce the revenue to not only run those schools and pay the teachers, but to create a university system to, uh, for the graduates to go on to and uh, become uh, knowledgeable about other kinds of things. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, process of change. And it, it gets initiated. There's a lot to be done so there, you could actually progress pretty quickly. And this is exactly what happened. Well, in terms of hookworm, mm -hmm. I, I, oh, I think we see a, a similar <laughs> pattern. Um, he wanted to talk about education. <laughs> I, I love to talk about hookworm. Um, <laughs> Um, at the Archive Center, we have perhaps uh, the world's leading collection of pictures and photographs of outhouses. Um, <laughs> and um, I have not included any of those in um, They, in they this all have the little crescent but, moon on them. Um, the, the question of hookworm um, was um, fascinating. If you go to the Archive Center website, in fact, you can see a 1920 silent film, uh, a public health film about hookworm used to educate Southerners. Hookworm, 
um, has been called the germ of laziness. Uh, I can say this as a southerner. Southerners of a certain era were offended to think that they were lazy because they had hookworm. Um, but in 1909, um, uh, the, the Rockefeller interests in New York created something called the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission for the Eradication of Hookworm. It began to work in the South in 1910, and over the next four years, uh, much as they had with the General Education Board, felt that they could use hookworm as a way of encouraging counties and states to begin to create public health systems. They were educating people about the disease, uh, teaching them to wear shoes. Actually, there's a funny story. Uh, some of the editorialists in Southern newspapers, uh, suspicious of these Northerners coming to the South, um, were absolutely convinced that Rockefeller financial directions meant that they were going to start selling shoes, uh, moving away from Standard Oil. <laughs> a a, a and big this, this was simply a strategy uh, to create a market for shoes. Um, in any event, their campaign was an educational campaign. Uh, it was a campaign to teach people how to build sanitary privies, uh, better outhouses. Uh, and they would set up public health clinics. For me, it is interesting to see that from the moment they began the campaign in the South, the people who were organizing the campaign realized that disease knows no boundaries. And they were going to take the program international from the outset. That was the plan. And the reason for this, and I, I think Gates articulated it uh, the most clearly, he felt that science and education were the most vital, um, vital ways of uh, approaching universal problems. And science and education, uh, which he described as uh, the brain and the nervous system of the human body, um, were essential to supporting the heart, which was all about public health. And uh, we've got, uh, I, I think, a wonderful story to expand to tell about global public health because, again, this has been one of the enduring commitments of Rockefeller philanthropy. And I think it connects more clearly than anything with some of the great philanthropic uh, undertakings of those who have made their wealth in the 21st century, namely uh, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Do you want to say more about global health? <laughs> well, I think it's a shame that you didn't bring any pictures of hookworms for us to see. Uh, but the, 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 uh, the, the film is on our website. Uh, don't watch and, and it. The, and uh, the rock don't watch it uh, yeah. during mealtime. Yeah. <clears throat> and actually, they weren't going to try and sell shoes. They were going to try and sell socks. <laughs> okay. P, uh, PUMC is up. Uh, okay, PUMC. Uh, another. Uh, Another area, why would Rockefellers become involved in building a medical college in China in, in the uh, first two decades of the 20th century? Among the, uh, the, uh, the individuals that John D. Rockefeller probably heard as a, as a, as a young boy in uh, upstate New York and in Cleveland, Ohio, were missionaries who had returned from the field talking about uh, converting the heathen to Christianity and so on. And among his very first contributions during this period of time were gifts to uh, the American uh, Foreign Baptist, Baptist Missionary Missions. Society, <clears throat> which had been engaged in China and other parts of the world for, for quite a long time. Uh, again, viewing the road to, uh, to positive social change is going to run through education and public health and that public health also requires a trained cadre of medical professionals. The idea was to create a medical school capable of producing Chinese doctors and other health professionals. And this, again, predates, uh, it, uh, it comes in, the, in uh, shortly after the creation of the General Education Board and the, uh, and the uh, PUMC was PUMC. organized in 1906. Yeah. PUMC opened right, in, in, in 1921. 1920. So there, there was a, a, a very 
uh, uh, interesting effort to kind of understand and create an institution in China that would be capable of doing many of the same things that were being accomplished in the United States, or at least uh, tried in the United States in that time. Yeah. And I assume that was probably the first kind of hospital of its kind in China, or was? Well, <clears throat> there, there, there were many, many missionary hospitals. Right. Yeah. And uh, these were more dispensaries and, mm -hmm. and doing very rudimentary work. The aim of this was to create a Johns Hopkins level yeah. medical right. institution in China. And does it still exist today? It does. Uh, it, it's remarkable. Uh, Jack Myers and I visited it uh, last spring, and uh, there was a conference on Western medicine in China. And I think the thing that impressed us the most is how the Chinese, despite all that country has been through, how, how well they understood the American philanthropic legacy. And I know that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund is working now with two Chinese universities uh, where they are creating centers to study and encourage philanthropy in China. So this is a long-term dividend of, uh, of the Rockefeller contributions to philanthropy. I think it's important to say, though, uh, that China was, while it consumed considerable resources, uh, $44 million uh, were expended for PUMC uh, between uh, the early 1900s and 1951. Um, it's hard to convert that into present dollars because uh, the contributions were made at different times. Um, but it was one of the most significant commitments. When the Rockefeller Foundation was created in 1913, its International Health Division began to take public health and other medical initiatives to other countries. Uh, here, um, they had focused on hookworm in the south and in other parts of the world, including Mexico. They worked on yellow fever. They worked on malaria, a uh, little bit of tuberculosis work uh, during World War uh, one in, in France. The aim, as Peter has suggested, was to create public health professionals to help different countries, and they worked in 80 different countries uh, between the beginning uh, in 1913-14 and, uh, and 1951. Uh, 80 different countries, thousands of fellowships, the creation of public health schools at Chicago, or, or sorry, at Hopkins, at uh, Toronto, uh, uh, London, and it, it, uh, yeah. it, it has been an enduring success. And some of the images uh, here, a yellow fever inspector, uh, these are Mexican uh, pictures, uh, clinics uh, work after the war. Here's uh, an institute of hygiene in Turkey. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Another way of, of looking at this is that uh, before uh, the end of World War II, the United States had no uh, uh, development or economic assistance that was sent overseas, foreign aid. In many ways, the Rockefeller Foundation was American foreign aid. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it took the place of, uh, of, of that kind of thing, and it was enormously successful uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the sense that it created mechanisms and institutions within many countries that were capable of then producing their own professionals to do these kinds of things. So it was, uh, it, it, was it's, it really is an amazing story. And it's, it's interesting that the International Health Division of the Foundation decided to leave the field um, when the, w, uh, when the World Health Organization came into existence after World War II. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, by the way, had worked before the war with the League of Nations Health Organization, even though uh, the United States was, was not a member of the League. Um, in fact, it's safe to say that something on the order of 40% of the League of Nations budget and some of the specialized agencies like the International Labor Organization uh, came from Rockefeller resources. Yeah. Missy, let's talk a little bit about Junior. First of all, how did Senior pass along his, his values and, 
and, uh, and philosophy about uh, philanthropy to his son. The, uh, as was the case with, with Senior himself, learning from his mother, Senior and his wife mm -hmm. felt it was extremely important to pass on these particular values to their own children. Uh, there, there was, these were very, this was a very close family. They, they spent time with one another. Uh, there was a, uh, an effort to transmit values from, uh, from uh, the parents' generation to the children. Uh, it became very clear to, to John D. Rockefeller Jr. and to his sisters from a very early age that uh, one of their responsibilities was to help those that needed their help. Uh, so uh, it, it was just there from the, from the very beginning. John D. Rockefeller Jr. revered his father. Uh, he did, revered his mother as well, but he, he believed that his father was one of the uh, greatest men who had ever lived and uh, wanted to help him as much as he could. Uh, he, he actually went into business. He graduated from Brown University, came back to New York, dutifully went to work for Standard Oil, and hated it. He just was not, uh, he didn't have the constituent elements to be a, uh, to be a businessman. And I uh, worked there for a while, but gradually convinced his father that all of these other things that his father was doing in terms of philanthropy fit what he wanted to do in a, uh, in, in a, in a much better way. So uh, within 10 years or so of, uh, of of joining his father's office, he had pretty much become exclusively involved with the management of both family philanthropies and the family office. Uh, yeah. So by then, it, the answer is he must have learned by the time he was four years old yes. what, uh, <laughs> what he needed to be doing. Yeah, so. and then and how did and his... There's, there's a ledger book. A ledger, from, yes, from, the yeah. famous He's ledger. A, yeah. Uh, uh, another family tradition that That's was right. carried yeah. carried forward beyond this. Uh, so, how did John John D. Jr.'s philanthropy differ from his father's? Say something about Colorado Fuel and Iron. All right, so, <coughs> to uh, to, to, to jump sense. forward uh, a little bit here in uh, in 1913, uh, the, the, there was an enormous amount of revenue that came out of Standard Oil on a yearly basis, and a significant amount of that uh, that came to John D. Rockefeller personally was used for philanthropy. Another very significant portion of it was used to invest in other companies, uh, railroads, banks, and so on and so forth. He didn't have controlling interests in many of, many of those, but this was a way of diversifying investments and so on. Uh, one of the, the uh, you've all heard the story of the Masabi Range and senior, senior having to bail out his younger brother and so on. Another company that the Rockefellers picked up during this period of time was called Colorado Fuel and Iron, based in uh, Pueblo, Colorado, uh, producing both the coal uh, to smelt the iron and the, uh, the, the iron itself. There was a very vicious, bitter labor struggle there in 1913 and 1914. Uh, most of the coal miners working for CF and I were uh, Eastern and Europeans, Mexicans. Uh, this this very, very bitter strike, the National Guard ended up being called out. And in a confrontation, there was a pitched battle and a number of the miners, and particularly miners' wives and children were, were killed. This led to an uproar uh, against the Rockefellers. Uh, this was a period of intense labor violence in the United States in, in any case. And this was one of the, the worst examples, but by no means the only one. Uh, it was at this point in time, that I, I think this was a critical moment in the history of the Rockefeller family. John D. Rockefeller had not yet determined what would happen to his fortune, which was probably right around a billion dollars at that time, or $20 billion in today's terms. He knew that his son didn't want to become involved in business. He loved his children deeply. He did not want to add to their burdens. He believed he had already begun setting aside and creating philanthropic institutions. As a result of the Ludlow strike, his son John D. Rockefeller Jr. sort of stepped forward. He accepted responsibility for what had happened. 
he felt that he had not understood as much as he needed to about was what was going on in the Colorado oil fields or uh, coal fields. It was at that point, and only at that point, that John D. Rockefeller realized that his son was capable of bearing the burden of great wealth and that he would uh, dispose of the wealth that was given to him in a, uh, in a way that would be uh, pleasing to him and improve the country in general. So it's only after that point in time that uh, John D. Rockefeller begins to transfer his own personal wealth to his son. He also made provision for his daughters, but much smaller amounts of money. Uh, but uh, Junior receives approximately half of the uh, of the, uh, uh, the the money that his father would hand on. Hand on. Uh, the other portion of it going to these uh, these great philanthropic foundations. But Ludlow is the key to understanding this. I think if John D. Rockefeller Jr. had said, well, you know, this is terrible, but I don't want any part of this, the money probably would have all gone to philanthropic institutions, and very little of it would have ended up with the family. We mentioned Andrew Carnegie before. Carnegie, having written The Man Who Dies uh, Wealthy Dies Disgraced, had given all of his money away to charity. He left almost nothing to his family. It's quite possible that John D. Rockefeller would have done the same thing for, for different reasons. Hmm. Yeah, so so um, what, can you talk about some of the philanthropic work that John D. Jr. Uh, engaged in? Because it's sure. quite varied. Um, this image, by the way, is uh, Jr. testifying with, at, at the Walsh Commission investigations on industrial relations. Uh, this public moment uh, and the two times that he testified, I think also convinced his father that this was an exceedingly capable young man who could win public favor. Uh, he had actually gone out to Colorado to the minefields uh, with Mackenzie King to study labor conditions. And uh, it, it was a decisive yes. moment. Uh, the philanthropy. Uh, I guess as, as we wind down, we'll have to be quick yep. about this. Yes. Um, yes. But I, I think it's important to see some of the differences uh, between junior and senior. The interest in historic preservation. Um, I think very few Americans and sad to say, perhaps even fewer French people know that the restoration of Versailles, of Fontainebleau, of Reims Cathedral were all of the work of, um, of Junior. Um, and there you see him at Versailles. Uh, and there you see the, the plaque. Um, so historic so, so, historic he, so he got, this came from a general interest in historic preservation, or how did he get engaged in this kind of work? He tended to see if he saw something that needed to be done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He would, and it interested him, he would take action to do something. In the, in the mid-1920s, uh, taking his family on vacations to Europe, he saw the devastation that was still present throughout mm -hmm. Europe, especially in France, and felt and realized that the French government was not in a position to repair uh, Rams Cathedral or, uh, or Fontainebleau. Fontainebleau or Versailles. So he agreed, uh, if the, the French government agreed to continue to maintain them to provide the funds for that. It was again during the 1920s on trips that he took his children to the American West that he realized that while there was a national park system, it had very, very little money. And uh, there were many areas of great national beauty and importance to the country that needed to be uh, protected. So he began seeing this issue, realizing that there was no public money or any other money available to do it. He would take action to take care of that. He felt as a result of uh, this sort of uh, nationalism uh, and uh, patriotic upheaval of the war years that Americans needed a better understanding of their own history and their own responsibilities as citizens of the United States and felt on a trip, again, to, uh, to Williamsburg, 
uh, a kind of dilapidated uh, Virginia town in the Tidewater, was convinced by a very persuasive fellow named W.A.R. Goodwin that, that in a certain sense, this is where American democracy had begun, the House of Burgesses and so on, self-government, and was sort of captured by Goodwin's passion and belief that, uh, that this was something important to do and agreed anonymously to begin purchasing uh, these historic homes and so on in Williamsburg. Uh, his intent was not to create a fairyland of, uh, you know, to restore a, uh, a, a Virginia town to its exact position in the, the mid 1700s. He wanted to use it as a place where people could really learn about their history and the importance of self-government. The, uh, the historic restoration is a very important part of that, but the two of them really needed to go together. Yeah, no, it, that was an, it's an extraordinary gift to America, yeah. among, the, among the many others, Williamsburg. And Winthrop Rockefeller, of course, chaired that, that board did. there for many, uh, many years. Um, so I'm, I'm a medieval historian, though. I just I can't yes. leave out the cloisters. OK. Um, and uh, <laughs> that, oh, to me, yes. is... Um, it's my favorite place in New York, I think. And uh, for those of us uh, who have studied medieval history, uh, it saves us a trip across the Atlantic to, uh, <laughs> now, to make all that the, journey. Now, we're talking about the religious kind of basis of Rockefeller philanthropy. You can see that the Rockefellers have now traveled a great distance. Senior was an American Baptist and proud of it. John D. Rockefeller, Jr., uh, in many ways, fell in love with the medieval world. While he did not convert to Catholicism, he was deeply imbued with this sort of the glory, the importance of religion within those societies. Uh, we, many of us have read uh, The Dynamo and the Virgin, uh, Henry Adams, wonderful. Uh, the Virgin uh, and the Dynamo. The Virgin Virgin and comes Dynamo. first. <laughs> okay, the Virgin and the Dynamo. This was the kind of thing. John D. Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller Jr. saw a kind of deeply spiritual quality to the medieval world, and he was hoping to recreate that somehow. That uh, that that spirituality and role of religion was very important. He was not going to impose it on anybody, but he was certainly intent on, on, on showing that this could be very important. Mm -hmm. And, and that this is why the Cloisters was created. It was not a, a rich man's fantasy. It, had, it was like Colonial Williamsburg, it was to serve a purpose, to remind people of community, of the need to collaborate and work together. And that's an easy segue for you to say something about Riverside Church, which is now yes, ahead. yes, because because actually uh, John D. Jr.'s uh, Baptist faith took moved in a more liberal direction. So perhaps you can mm. tell us about that. Is it okay to word, use the word liberal in Arkansas? No. <laughs> <laughs> you're afraid you're going to be run out of the <laughs> state. <clears throat> With the uh, in, again, first two decades of the uh, of the 20th century the, the uh, growing tension between liberal and modernist tendencies in American religion, especially in American Protestant, uh, Protestantism, came to the fore. Uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. ended up leaving the Northern Baptist Convention because of the position that they had taken on, an, on a, a number of positions and allied himself quite clearly and quite publicly with the modernizing elements in American Protestants, uh, Protestantism. In fact, he saw very little uh, utility in emphasizing denominational doctrinal differences. He had been told by people who had spent time in China that the Chinese were baffled by the uh, dogmatic differences between Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists and Episcopalians. It just didn't seem to make any sense. He thought, again, that what people really needed was community, uh, a community of belief that they would work together. Riverside Church became the, probably the greatest expression of American modernist Protestantism. Uh, in the, it was an effort to break down denominational barriers. It is 
still ostensibly Northern Baptist and, and congregational, I think, or is it Presbyterian and congregational? I forget. But uh, in, in any case, this was an effort to create a different church body in the United States. It led to the creation of the, uh, the, the, the uh, Council of Churches and so on and so forth. So. And the, and the um, I believe the, the statues that are there are, are not of no, no. saints and right. uh, Arist bishops and yeah, canons, but tell us who they are. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't know all of them. I, the, I do know that I am not one of the statues <laughs> well, there. But, uh, it's science. Well, but they were, yeah, they were right. great thinkers, yeah, and, and including, I thought it was interesting, Galilean, Charles, yeah. Charles Darwin is mm, one of the people yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. featured. At, you know, at the same time that the Scopes trial was going on in Tennessee <laughs> on uh, you know evolution, John D. Rockefeller Jr. is building this beautiful modern cathedral in New York that has this, instead of St. Paul or St. Peter, it's got Charles Darwin as one of the statues. <laughs> well, what could be a more uh, you know, striking yeah. example? So. Well, listen, we, we wish we had, because we truly this could be a three-hour conversation if there were time for it, because it's such a, a rich, rich story. But it's going to be, it's time now to move on to two more generations. Uh, do you want to just close out with the brothers for a second before we uh, Fine. <clears throat> You'll, you, will, uh, you will notice here that we're uh, talking about the first two generations of the uh, Rockefeller family, John D. Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller Jr., and then we will be talking with members of subsequent generations of the Rockefeller family, the fourth and fifth generations, leaving this big gaping hole in the middle, which is the brother's generation and uh, their sister, Abby. Uh, let, let me just say that uh, the work of the brothers will come up in uh, sort of at least an indirect uh, context. But the, the five Rockefeller brothers are the inheritors of this tradition, and they are also the transmitters of the tradition to their children and grandchildren. Uh, the, the, the Rockefeller brothers would in many ways manage and be responsible for the most important of the Rockefeller institutions. The Rockefeller Foundation, uh, the, uh, uh, the Rockefeller, Rockefeller uh, University, Colonial Williamsburg. They would also form another institution which would characterize their own giving and unite their own giving, which is the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Uh, but we're not intentionally excluding them, uh, but feel that it's really a story, this is a really a story of uh, a tradition unfolding through time rather than concentrating solely on, on one generation or another. And, and what it also is, in my view, is a story of how philanthropy in this country, uh, through this family, generation after generation, has renewed itself, addressing new problems, new challenges, finding new strategies, building new institutions, and if there is a lesson that I take from having been privileged to, to work at the Archive Center and to study this tradition, it is that we have to think about philanthropy as a way of meeting new challenges and letting each generation find a way to renew this tradition of private initiative. Absolutely. Very good. Well, the, thank you for a fascinating conversation, Peter and Jim.